to another Alaska Quarterly Review Literary Hour. It's so inspiring to hear Alaska Quarterly Review contributors read their work and chat a bit. You can find recordings of our many previous programs at our website. It's aqreview.org and also on our YouTube channel. Um, I'm Heather Lendy, the Alaska Writer Laureate, and on behalf of the Center for Narrative and Lyric Arts and our hosts, the Anchorage Museum at Rasmussen Center, thank you for being here today. Dunashish, as we say, uh, where I am on the banks of the Chilkat River in Haines, Alaska, or Deshu in Blinket Ani. We have some wonderful poets today, Dee Dee Jackson, uh, and, and a fellow Alaskan, Allison Akuchik Warden, and hopefully Susan Rich will be joining us. But first, I'd like to introduce Ron Spatz, the co founder and editor in chief of Alaska Quarterly Review. Uh, Ron is a professor of English at the University of Alaska, a former National Endowment for the Arts fellow, and the recipient of two Alaska Governor's Awards and a Contribution to Literacy Award from the Alaska Center for the Book. Under Ron's over 40 years of leadership and vision, Alaska Quarterly Review has uh, created strong connections between uh, our state, Alaska, and the uh, larger literary community in, in the US and, and, and internationally, and has been um, especially influential in supporting new and emerging writers, as well as presenting works that include a rigorous questioning of larger societal issues. Ron? Well, thank you, Heather, and welcome everyone. This event is being recorded and will be available on the Alaska Quarterly Review YouTube channel. Please feel free to watch any of our prior programs and share them. Alaska Quarterly Review is committed to presenting these programs without charge and to showcase vibrant and diverse new and emerging voices and literary conversations with depth complexity, and humanity. Before we begin, I'd like to make a few important acknowledgments. Alaska Quarterly Review gratefully acknowledges the, Alaska, the Anchorage Museum for hosting and the Center for the Narrative and Lyric Arts. Alaska Quarterly Review's 501c3 umbrella, umbrella organization making this event possible. I also want to make a land acknowledgment Alaska Quarterly Review recognizes the indigenous land on which all Alaskans live. AQR is located in Anchorage, and Anchorage is Denina homeland. Denina is the language spoken by the traditional, present, and future caretakers of this land, and land acknowledgement opens a space with gratefulness and respect for the contributions, innovations, and contemporary perspective of indigenous peoples and marks our collective movement toward decolonization and equity. Joining me today as co-moderator, you've met Heather Lendy, Alaska's Writer Laureate. Heather is the author of four books, all published by Algonquin. If you lived here, I'd know your name. Take good care of the gardens and the dogs, find the good and of bears and ballots. And now to begin, I send it over to Heather to introduce our poets. Well, I'm really excited <laughs> for uh, today's show. Um, Dee Dee Jackson is with us and Dee Dee is uh, the author of Moon Jar, most recently from Red Hen Press in 2020 and the forthcoming collection, My Infinity. And in addition to Alaska Quarterly Review, American Co Poetry Review, uh, uh, her poems have appeared in Kenyan Review and The New Yorker, Oxford American, Plowshares, and Virginia Quarterly Review, among many other journals and magazines. Her chapbook, Slag and Fortune, was published by Floating Wolf Quarterly, and she has had poems selected for The Best American Poetry, Academy of American Poets, Poem a Day, the Slowdown with Tracy K. Smith and Together in Sudden Strangeness, America's Poets Respond to the Pandemic. She's the recipient of the Robert H. Winner Memorial Award from the Poetry Society of America and was a finalist for the Meringhoff Prize in Poetry. Tracy Brimhall says Dee Dee Jackson's poems are, quote, a study in the Simone Weil, quote, absolute attention is prayer. They are gorgeously wrought but they also make my mind sit up straighter, our minds sit up straighter. 
Each one pulled me back to reread, savor, and think alongside. She called them smart, as all true, of course, we do too, smart, surprising, and deeply attentive. Dee Dee uh, is an assistant professor of English and creative writing at Vanderbilt University and comes to us today from um, uh, Nashville, home in Nashville. Uh, Allison Akuchik Warden is an Inupiaq poet who lives in Fairbanks, Alaska, and she's a tribal member of the native village of Hektovic. Her poem, We Acknowledge Ourselves, was recently featured in Poetry Magazine, and she was also a featured poet for the podcast series. She recently collaborated as a poet for Hyphen Labs Project for Google Arts and Cultures, and her poems have been installed as part of the 2017-2018 Unsettled exhibition, which debuted at the Nevada Museum of the Arts and then toured both the Palm Springs Art Museum and also uh, our hosts here at the uh, Anchorage Museum at Rasmussen Center, um, which, which hosts these programs. Her poem, Portal Traveler, is the first poem she had accepted in a, in a major literary magazine and is forthcoming in AQR's Winter 2022 edition. Allison uses rap and performance to engage her audience with stories and themes of Inupiat people, paying homage to tradition while bringing a totally fresh perspective. The breadth and impact of her work has been recognized through many residencies and awards, including here in Alaska, the Alaska Governor's Award for the Arts and Humanities, in particular for her work with youth and a grant from the Art Matters Foundation, which honors artists whose work break ground aesthetically and socially. Allison Akuchik Warden, who says, all year long, I work quietly in different mediums, preparing projects for later debut, akin to serving on a whaling crew. All of the different activities serve a similar goal, to bring the perspectives of my ancestors forward into today, igniting fires within others to work for their people in an omnidirectional way. And now uh, I'm really pleased to introduce Dee Dee, who will begin, and then Allison will be next. And if Susan uh, Rich joins us, uh, she will be uh, third. So Dee Dee. Hi, um, thank you so much, Heather, for that introduction. And I wanna say thank you um, also to Cody behind the scenes there and um, for Ronald for organizing this and, and organizing these really beautiful readings. Um, I was able to visit that YouTube page or I think they would call it pages, YouTube channels. Um, and it's really, it's really wonderful. So, um, and uh, yes, and it's a real pleasure too to read with you, Allison. So, um, Today, I thought I would read um, from a little bit of each of these collections that I have. Moonjar would be my first book that did um, was released during the pandemic, um, and I didn't get a chance to do too much reading from it. Um, so I'll read a handful of poems from there, and I, I want to read um, a handful of poems from my collection that's forthcoming, My Infinity, and then I'll end with a couple of new poems, poems that are um, really fairly right off the Printer. Um, okay, so I'm going to start off with a poem titled Kill All Lies. After his death, my hair did not grow, my nails peeled and flaked, my bones were lifted into a sack upon my legs, even my muscles decayed from the lack of wild oranges and sweet tea. This is the new myth of my life. When visiting Spain, a cricket was loose in my kitchen. Its chirp was like my name, like the words, yes, yes. But what could a dead woman know of yes? That summer, one cricket became two, two became four. It was then I memorized the trill and grind of my name. Like a vandal with a can of red spray paint, I could scrawl the words, kill lies all across my Guernica. Who will be the bull, the horse? Who the severed head and arm? Under the bald lamp, like an eye, I will expose old scars and breastfeed a shadow of myself. 
Um, Moonjar uh, addresses um, the loss of my second husband to suicide. Um, and the book itself moves through that trauma, um, then into a period of what I always call kind of a renaissance for myself, like a find, finding myself, and then ends the collection ends with um, finding new love. Um, and so I thought I would pull some examples from each of those. This poem is titled Slip. The cat slips out the window. The thread slips past the eye. The sun slips into the stratus. The letter S slips past my tongue. The lead slips beyond the drop of the Y. A steel pyramid slipped in and out of utility knife. The blade slipped into the skin on the wrist and neck. The whisper song of the jays slips from beak to beak tree to tree, he slipped down the bathroom wall. I slip on ice, I do not see. The temperature slips past zero. Our photos slip from its place in the frame. The river slips past the storm down tree. I slip past a wedge of light to enter the morgue. I let it slip, suicide. The blooms of the lilac slip into a purple and white parade. At the end of the day, I slip out of my body. I should think I would be able to get right to these poems. Um, when I met my new and current husband, um, we were able to travel to Italy. And um, this poem we wrote while there. And it's titled Ribolita, and I don't need to explain it um, more than that. It um, it's a soup, <laughs> a delicious soup. Yeah. Ribolita. In the Tuscan farmhouse, I cook ribolita, a peasant soup of white beans, crumbled bread, and kale, as the Campanile de San Biagio rings in the centuries. Though not Catholic maybe not even Christian, I kneel in the shadow of this church and look deep inside the sleeves of a sweater I've worn too many months. After taking his own life, the husband I knew burned in a box I chose from several boxes. I also chose his clothes, the urn, and in the end asked for him to look like death, not a false life. Yet here I am considering a soup hundreds of years old the golden altar of the Madonna de Bon Viaggio in this and the sound of bells in the lower fields near our farm. I know the path to San Biagio like I know the roof of my own mouth, bells like foil between my teeth, electric. The scent of footprints might confuse the dead, but each night I end up between the sheets, windows open in the last hour of lovemaking among bedbugs and common centipedes in my new husband's arms, trafficking old scars. I hear the prune plums fall from the trees. I will collect and skin them in the morning. And I'll finish with this, uh, from, this, from, this from this collection um, with the title poem, Moon Jar. My wedding ring is missing one small diamond and I like it that way a reminder of the imperfect in all of us, like that keyhole size of grief that remains crystalline. In Korea, ceramicists for centuries have made moon jars, testimony to the virtue of modesty, asymmetrical warping on the wheel, slumping in the pine heated kiln, impurities when fired, black dots and pox on its surface like freckles on skin. I've been kept awake so many nights by the moon, its pull on the pines and night birds, and who, like a monk, keeps a sharp order of time. Never a perfect sphere, the milky moon jar joins two clay hemispheres into one. When the light of the moon finds me, I am the color of everything in the winter night. Um, so I, I get migraines. Um, I've suffered from migraines since I was in my early 20s. 
a doctor once thought I had encephalitis. I mean, being in Florida, it's, I mean, with the mosquitoes, that's not maybe unheard of, but um, that was the crazy uh, uh, condition that it was early on. And one of the symptoms I have, and many people have, well, not many people, but several people get this, is the aura that accompanies a migraine. And so I'll get the aura first. Um, and so um, one of the two poems that I, I'm gonna read from my infinity um, also is in Alaska Quarterly. And um, I will read this first one, which is, a, a, it's from a quote from Frank Stella, the artist Frank Stella. And I taught art history. Art also often plays a role in my work. You can, I talked about Guernica earlier, the Picasso painting. And then, so this is a quote by Frank Stella and it's the title, what you see is what you see, which I just love because I, when I have a migraine, I have to kind of just sit and let it go. And it's actually, if I didn't know the pain was gonna come, it's really, an amazing, beautiful, almost like kind of outer body experience to see this aura, it really is. But I know it's coming, it's the pain, but. So what you see is what you see. Frank Stella would be proud of my migraines, especially those that come after sex, exquisite pleasure, thin blindness, the hard edged jagged lines with dago, dayglow colors that grow into a barbed crescent eating at one side of my head until it passes, like a lit up road sign, paracentral, mid peripheral, far peripheral, gone. Then the Viri picks up a flute outside my window and I can hear every tiny whirl inside the metal pipe of its throat. A song some in the 19th century called seductive. And finally I can find my clothes and smell the ground coffee we made hours ago. Sheets pungent with sweat the rain a few miles away. Under this geometric spell and pills like wasps beneath my tongue, I am the closest to my true self. And I secretly love my agony, just as I love the blue webbing of veins on my legs, wrinkles like tidal ripples on my face. I know that the pain will come and eventually go. The birches grow still before the storm, like they want to hear us, like, they are voyeurs listening in to both kinds of my ecstasy. So before I moved to Nashville, I um, was living in Vermont. So I lived in Florida for about 40 years, moved to Vermont. It was like night and day, obviously. Um, I tried to get used to the cold and the snow. Um, <laughs> uh, I did okay. I snowshoed regular, you know, often enough. Um, so uh, I, I, I found myself writing about uh, Vermont and all the different kinds of snow and um, all the iterations of snow, all the different seasons of snow. Anyway, so um, in, in, in just hiking up there in the mountains and being in the Green Mountains um, was just really influential to my work. So this next poem that is also that was also um, in Alaska Quarterly is Witness. And I wanted to read both those um, today. So Witness. At this hour, on this day, in this place, at this exact light, the birch leaves shimmy. How they clap at the sun with their golden hands, like early Christians raising their open palms to pray, then settling, basking in the late afternoon's golden glow. The pair of ruffled grouse I flushed earlier were frightened only by me, two small firecrackers lifting from golden goldenrod and milkweed, keeping low to the earth, too heavy for their want of a higher flight. The green mountains flex their muscles and like an old horse's withers twitch a little. They must know summer's closing. It is their secret and I'm good with secrets. A singular airplane scars the sky a metal bead lit like a speck of diamond, heads straight for the crescent moon, still foggy in the twilight. I was never going to let myself be so small, but often I was the only one to know the difference between the call of the oven bird and indigo bunting, between the time in college I wanted to be desired and then deciding to do whatever a boy wanted in order to get away. Tonight, I'm the only one here to witness the end of the day, songs that quiet the heat of the setting sun. Um, so 
I also am looking forward to fall. And so I thought I would read a poem titled Fall. Um, I'm used to the heat. Everyone warned us that the Nashville heat was just ridiculous and it is. I mean, coming from Florida, there's no, it's a different kind of heat and the summer seemed hotter than ever. And it, someone once said to me, that was something that was interesting said, well, this is the hottest, what the hottest summer, um, every summer will be the next, the hottest summer for the rest of your life kind of way. And just the expectation of this global warming and the heating, but so I'm looking forward to fall. So I thought I would read a fall poem titled Fall with an epigraph by Louise Glick. Do you know what I was, how I lived? It's a goldfinch, one of the two small girls, both daughters of a friend sees hit the window and fall into the fern. No one hears the small thump, but she, the youngest, sees the flash of gold against the mica sky as the limp feathered envelope crumples into the green. How many times in a life will we witness the very moment of death? She wants a box and a small towel, some kind of comfort for this soft body that barely fits in her palm. Its head rolling side to side, neck broke, eyes still wet and black as seed. Her sister, now at her side, wears a dress too thin for the season, white as the winter only weeks away. She wants me to help, wants a miracle. Whatever I say now, I know weighs more than the late fall's layered sky, the jeweled leaves of the maple and elm. I know too, it is the darkest days I've learned to praise, the calendar packages of time, the days shrink and fold away until the new season. We clothe, burn, then bury our dead. I know this, they do not. So we cover the bird, story its flight, imagine his beak singing. They pick up, they pick the song and sing it over and over again. Um, I should have looked better at the time. I think I'm coming close. I have maybe a, a couple more minutes. Um, so this last, this next collection that I'm working on, um, right now the title's Starling, and I'm interested in um, lots of things in terms of things that are forsaken, things that are unwanted, um, people uh, I'm adopted. So I'm gonna be looking into, into the idea of that. Um, moving to Nashville, I had family members who lived here and my father lived here and one of his sisters was buried in an unmarked grave. Um, and I'm just really trying to discern what that means to be um, an unwanted. And so I've also been interested in looking at invasive species for this reason. And what does it mean to be invasive? Um, and so coyotes are big here um, and they're on the email, the website, the neighborhood websites all every all the time. They're eating people's cats and dogs and such, or little dogs, I guess. Um, and I'm fascinated. I'm also fascinated with the starling. Um, because they're so beautiful and gorgeous, but I know birders who absolutely hate them. They're, it's actually recommended to kill baby starlings if you see them in a nest, which sounds just horrible, but, and I could never bring myself to do something like that, but that's an, an advice. So I'll read um, um, one or two poems from that and then, and then I'll, that'll, I'll, that'll be it. Um, so uh, this poem was influenced, it's titled Sternus vulgaris, which is the Latin phrase for starling. And it's from, um, Robert Hayden's poem, uh, A Plague of Starlings, it's influenced from that, which he wrote while he was here at this at Na in Nashville. Sternus vulgaris for Robert Hayden. The stones in the path behind our home mimic the cords of the highway and the fabric of the honeysuckle fills the edges enough to muffle the grit of the alley where days ago we walked past the dead body of a starling, stiff as a bundle of branches eyes eaten and cored, feet frozen, gripping the clouds. Everyone hates the starlings. And I'm always surprised at how people abhor that which assimilates the best. Plumage of the starry night sky, beak of yellow whirs and rattles, flight of a four-pointed four star. So many want them dead. They thrive. The male decorates nests with flowers to attract his, attract his mate. They are minor birds known to imitate a ringing phone, kill deer, a red tail hawk, car alarms, the name Mortimer, 
Nay, I have a starling shall be taught to speak nothing but Mortimer and give it to him to keep his anger still in motion. Feathered bullets, dense chunks of winged bark, shapeshifters, breathing giants in the early evening sky. And those lines are from, are from Shakespeare. I see, I, I feel like I should, I should, I think that's a good place to end. Um, I'm super excited to see, I think Susan's here. So I wanna thank you all for tuning in to, to, this, to this recording and, um, and for listening to my work so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dee. That was um, fabulous. And um, yes, Susan Rich has joined us. So uh, Allison will be next. And then I'll introduce Susan uh, when Allison is done. So uh, take it away, Allison. Fairbanks <laughs> Um, it's good to see you. It's nice to see Ronald's face um, after so many phone calls. And it's uh, an honor to hear your work, Dee Dee. I'm, I'm super inspired. And I've, it's funny, I also, I'm, I'm working on something around death and love. Um, so it's, and, and I, I'm obsessed with the moon, so. <laughs> We have some points here that are meeting and I'm happy. And hello, Susan. Thank you, Heather, and thank you, Cody. I'll start with um, the poem that will be published by AQR. And it's been such an honor to um, be um, held by AQR and encouraged. And I'm so thankful that they accepted my poem. Portal Traveler. These future days, she watches through portals, flashbacks to the 80s, the time when elders glowed, night lights, sitting near one, like soaking up an entire library section on grace. If I could only reach through the screen to touch the cine of their sunshine rough parkas, that would be the infusion of the long, long, long ago, a swift kick dance back into how they kept the earth steady under their feet. And then I'll read the poem, We Acknowledge Ourselves, that's currently on Poetry Magazine. I'm part of their podcast and they did little snippets of the poem, but not the whole thing. So <laughs> I'll read the whole thing here. And this poem was, um, they have a land acknowledgement issue, an indigenous focused poetry issue around uh, this idea of land acknowledgement. So this was my response to that. We acknowledge ourselves. Before we bring this meeting to order, we want to acknowledge ourselves. The Kaktogo Vigamute. Yes, Saloon, this is how they are doing things nowadays. We are doing it right. We acknowledge ourselves, the Kaktogo Vigamute. We are the people of this island and of the mountains and lands around us and all our traditional hunting areas. Since before the military came and bulldozed our old sod houses, our entire village, so they could make a runway. And yes, we are still angry about that. And we are still wanting reparations for what they did. They finally did take that hanger down and it looks better without that big old thing on there. And I know we are still looking for what was lost in the Nuna on that day. What they did was wrong and we are still here. And even though the military still today has that huge other hangar on the other side with that military man who lives in there that we have never met and the other that relieves him every three weeks or so, we were here before. 
they put those big humongous radar ears up and then took them down. And yes, they left many barrels and still never got all of them. We want all their residue to be off our island forever. We were here before. The government started drawing arbitrary lines, encasing us into this wildlife refuge without our full knowledge or consent. Where strangers break into our cabins on our own land, up in the mountains each and every year, no, many, no matter how many signs we put or what kind of locks we use. And because of these borders, not our own, we cannot hunt the way our relatives in other villages hunt. We have more restrictions and regulations than the others, yet we are still able to get the food we need around the land we care for and know. E, we are still fighting these unlawful borders and lines today. Thank you, Ikawan. And also thank you, Angaluk, for those letters you put out. They needed to see that. And all of us fighting for our ways of life and continue to fight even in this strange language we had to learn to fight them with. Ali, piliak sunga, taniktun ukagama. We acknowledge our elders that are still on this land and our ancestors buried just over there and over there too. And our own people who are still living here especially the little ones like Ukumai Lakir and all our future relatives yet to be born. We acknowledge and remember that the military did experiments without our consent on our elders when they were kids. And the government, government has never owned up to these injustices, but we remember what was done. And yes, some elders did get compensated for that radioactive iodine they put in their veins, yet not the other forced experiments. And we remember how we were also made to send our young people away to go to school and how they came back having to relearn their own language and many of them left right away again. Yet many stayed home and the others always returned and belong home here. We, the Kaktogovigamut, remember how we have always been whole. Nakurugut, we are good. We have always been good. Living here in the ways taught to us by our elders and our elders, elders, elders. And even though there were two waves of diseases that we didn't know how to fight naturally, we lost many of our people, yet many of, of us survived those waves. And since we are talking about these things in a community hall meeting, might as well mention the alcohol that came to kill us and the cancers that we can guess where those came from too. And the fog of smoke and cock that has stayed and lingered. And I know that we aren't used to acknowledging ourselves. But when me and Fanny went to the big meeting in Anchorage, they did one of these land acknowledgements. So apparently everyone is starting to remember. And we remember too, how to acknowledge one another's and how we remember our relatives and how we are related. We remember how to sing and dance and how to take care of the land. And the one in Anchorage was not as good as this one. Because we need to acknowledge our young people too. Even the ones who are pretending they don't understand or can't talk yet. We know you are paying attention. Yet we also want to say the young ones have also been having a lack of listening. And they need to fix that right now. Oh, and of course, our relationship to the animals. The Agavik, the Tutu, the fish, the Nanuk, the Kavik. Oh, yes, the Ivik and the Baluka whale. And I know I am forgetting some animals. Thank you, Ukpik. And we were here before the tourists started to travel here to see our polar bears. 
without giving back to the community. And yes, we are starting to regulate those tourists too, as a community working together. Yes, the Amogok, and I know we have too many animals to mention right now, and we need to get started with these door prices soon. That, yeah, let me say one more time, because I see that Michael just came through the door. We, the Kaktohovigamut, acknowledge ourselves, sovereign here on our own land, sovereign here forevermore, despite all of these other ways in which they thought they could make us forget or think we were broken. We are whole and good, and we remember all of it. An unbroken line going all the way, all the way, all the way back from the time before the time before. Nakurut. We are the Kakto Ravigamut, the original playful of this place. We have never ceded our lands. We always remember our long, long, long ago ways. That we are living even today, and even though we are thankful for many modern tools that we have put to use in the ways that our elders agree with, the outsider's ways are not our ways. We belong here and on our mountains and all the places near that we travel for food and on the ocean. We remember who we are. Today and forevermore, we acknowledge ourselves in our powers in Ipeak. Now, Alasurak will draw the first prize because I believe he is our oldest elder here. We will draw a couple few more door prizes now at the start and then the rest at the end of the meeting. I know we have a lot to talk about. I've been writing my whole life, but quietly. And I did publish a story in like 1991, <laughs> a long time ago. Um, but I had a dream and my ancestors were like, we want you to become a writer. And they were so intense and like, well, very sweet actually. And so I, I was like, okay, I'll just um, put all my energy towards this. Um, most of my energy because I'm still making music. Um, so there's a lot of work I'm working on, but I, I am fairly new to the publishing world. So I feel like I have to wait to see if they're accepted. And then um, I feel like if I say them before they get published, then I'm um, breaking the rules or something. <laughs> so I'll read a couple more poems that um, I, uh, submitted, but then withdrew because I got the formatting wrong, but I still like them. The Transition. Her mother's body laid lifeless in the hospital bed. After a broken hip became complicated and crashed the matriarch into the realm of nightmares edging the dream time of her one biological daughter an artist, adept at swimming into the underworld where death laughs and dances without rhythm or beats. The first dream, her mother became a talking wooden puppet that the artist moved under the blankets as strangers were approaching. Another dream, her mother unearthed herself from her dewy gravesite, worms falling off her dirt layered skin and the family around her, including the daughter, acted as if everything was normal, hustling to find her something to snack on. She knew that her mother might be ready to move on when in another dream, she turned to her daughter and asked, Panin, am I dead? The diplomatic response was something like, no, you are alive to me right now. But yes, your body technically is in the ground, up in the village, buried deep. And then there was a peace in the dream time, a stasis of sorts. 
Until last night, she came back to feed her daughter a bowl of electric moving worms and bucks that somehow were spilled all over the shag death green carpet, squirming from bent shadows and light fractures. The effect of the bowl offering sent the artist into a schismatic state presented as a terror seizure and all the others in the dream were set back by her over dramatic reaction. And one worm did manage to enter through her left foot towards the end, shocking her back from her midday nap. And I'll do one, I don't know how many times. <laughs> I don't know how long these things take. Um, I'll do another one that I will put out there and I would like this. The ones that I'm most obsessed with right now, I feel like I need to protect them to see if they're accepted or not. And then if um, hopefully, <laughs> if they get brutally rejected, then I'll feel free to read them. But right now I'm protecting them but they have to do with the moon and death. And so I'm, I like these um, points of connection. Zero G. Shamans around the world have been initializing their own communication infrastructure, reopening musty, musty travel portals, strengthening telepathic abilities through colors and numbers, a ping pong traditional brain dance. A shaman might be in the dance club, wearing something white and iridescent, flashing in a nano beat as a polar bear woman, and then back again outside the club. She might come on a little too strong, talking loudly about her lonely hotel room bed, sending brain waves to the others like her across the beta strings that sing invisibility songs towards her tundra homelands. These motions track as EMF bursts, dream signals, time lapses, undercurrent laugh tracks. Another shaman in the deep forests of Brazil picks up her signal like a smooth oval stone from the river that he follows to buy his daily Americano. He flashes back feather plumes that surface from a still lake. His heartbeat, heartbeat sinks with her disharmonious gaze. She is looking through all of the skyscrapers as if she can see beyond towards the ocean folds. Her message received as the zero G network slowly emerges from the beta state. And then um, I do have a little book here. Oh, how do you do it? That the Anchorage Museum published in um, uh, 2016. So I have a Twitter account that has like 103,000 followers or something really big like that. And I use it just for poetry, Twitter poems. I like the challenge of the, this was before they made the word, the, the character count a lot bigger. This is when you had a little tiny place. Now it's like they tripled the character count in size. I thought it was fun to try to write poems in their tiny little restrictions. And so um, if you wanna see me there, I'm at, AKU underscore MATU. Um, but we made a book of those little teeny tiny poems. Do I share the story of when we knew peace before we learned to fight in paperwork language? Or do I sing a song bigger than reality TV? And one last one, because I have no sense of time. <laughs> she holds the memories 
of all things that have happened in her village. From the time before the colonizers came, declared things we hold. Okay, thank you so much. Ariga, nakupalok to tin. I just, um, nakupalok hisi, nakupalok hisi. Um, that was good for all of us. Or <laughs> we are all good or something like that. I'm learning in Upiak, so I, I like to use it as much as I can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Allison and, and Didi. And um, wow, this is just turning into a fabulous uh, hour here. It'll probably a little longer. Susan, um, please uh, take your time because it's, um, it just keeps getting better and better. And um, I wanna welcome uh, Susan Rich and introduce her. Uh, Susan, um, in case you don't know, is an award-winning poet. She's an editor and an essayist and, and she's a, a mentor and a, and a teacher to many. She's the author of five poetry collections, including Gallery of Postcards and Maps, New and Selected Poems, as well as Cloud Pharmacy, The Alchemist's Kitchen, Cures Include Travel, and The Cartographer's Tongue, Poems of the World. Her poetry has received um, all kinds of awards from the Artist Trust, Penn USA, the Foundation, the Times Literary Supplement of London uh, for Culture, and many more. Um, her recent work, um, appears in Alaska Quarterly Review, but also the Gettysburg Review, the New England Review, and Oprah Quarterly Magazine. Her sixth collection of poems, Blue Atlas, is forthcoming from Red Hen Press in spring of 2024, and it's our pleasure to uh, welcome you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I had to travel because of my internet went out, so I'm at a dear friend's home, but it, traveling was part of getting here, so my apologies for being late. AQR has been supportive of my work for, I, I'm i afraid to say how many years, but many decades. It was one of the first journals to publish me, and so um, I, I it has a special place in my heart. And I think I'll start with the poem that will be in the next edition, which I looked at what I'm reading today. And I think a lot of these poems are about um, mentors of one way or another, poetry mentors, art mentors, and people you meet along the path. So this poem is called Compass. Elizabeth Bishop often kept a compass in her small jacket pocket. A little known fact about the poet who fell regularly from a delicate map of sobriety lost her keys entire weeks, even countries. Could a compass initially used in fortune telling, invented in the Han dynasty, buoy her with its divining arrow, its quivering and irregular heartbeat? What are the coordinates of the soul? Mist filled or incandescent, briny as ocean air, or rugged as Oro Preto. Bishop could lose herself in the architecture of a birdcage, the clack of wooden clogs. But with binoculars strung round her neck like miniature islands, a compass in her hand, her brokenness could orient her. Her brokenness could console her like a harbor chart or a naked pink dog. If you know Elizabeth Bishop's work, you probably recognize bird cages and maps and binoculars and things. The piece of art that you see behind me is by the artist um, Leonora Carrington, who I swear to you, there'll be a Hollywood movie about her life very soon. She is an amazing artist. She wrote a cult favorite novel called The Hearing Trumpet. The piece behind me is called Fantastic Figures on Horses. So I'm only telling you all that because I'm gonna read a couple of poems that are about Leonora Carrington, not necessarily about this piece, but this gives you a flavor for her kind of fantastical androgynous work. She was a contemporary of Frida Kahlo, 
and I could spend all of my time telling you the wild life she had, but I'll just um, I'll just say that you should find out about her because she's really cool. Self-portrait as Leonora Carrington. I never understood how it happened, the doorknob turning left, not right, until the different selves assembled. How I recognized myself in the blue chair, like a hangover of sky, complete with hyena and rocking horse. A kind of overworked alchemy that made the chair legs wear the same boots that I wore, painted with a delicate dab, six buttons up the side, like soused constellations working after hours. And when no one was there, the horse, shoeless, stumbled out the doorway, mane matted and unadorned. She cantered to the orchard for just a moment, yet in her clouded loneliness, how she howled, how she opened her ginger mouth to the sky, apricots buzzing on the branches as if to join her. How did she transform from toy to Pegasus? How do I toss off my blue dress of missteps and instead choose a star map that slips me through to another galaxy? Goodbye to the asparagus of self-doubt the onion skin of the lonely. Instead, let this hangover open into uncharted happiness. Let the sweetness be dangerous. Unfasten the windows from their frames. Take off the rooftop from the triple-decker house. Join the hyena, the horse, and the girl. Offer them wings. She's kind of surrealist in case that didn't come through. <laughs> and one of the things that just fascinates me about Leonora Carrington is that her best friend, Remedios Varro, was also a painter and they inspired each other and they hung out in each other's kitchens and they learned how to make medieval recipes that might bring on alchemy. And I, I love that the story survives that women, artists, women poets need each other. And so here's another self-portrait. This time it comes from a painting by Remedios Varro, another cool woman. Self-portrait with stained glass and feathers. As she works, everything wakes up and takes notice. From the alembic paint machine assistant to the magnifying glass that she uses to render tropical birds, Merlins and Yucatan night jars that soon exit her canvas, then spiral above the church windows into a ghost night over poured with bright constellations, which the painter lightens into breathing orbs, the same shape that her brown raptor-like face takes as she concentrates on her visions. And though the birds exhaust her, she pulls each one out of her musical heart, the perfect body part for a woman transitioning to an owl, which every girl knows will require more than a prayer and a spell. And I think I'm going to switch paths a little bit. I said I was thinking of what linked these poems together, and it's for women that have inspired me, that have meant a lot to me. And so this next poem is for an actual, well, it's for a woman whose name was Grace Jones, but not that Grace Jones. Um, Grace Jones, who was the mom of a friend of mine who I met on the back of a bus when I was 16. And when I lived in England for a number of years, she really, she mothered me. So this is a poem honoring her and it's called Elegy for Grace. Tea of conversation over burnt toast and black currant jam. Breakfast tea 
I'm going to just stop for a minute and say this all took place in England, which is why this litany of tea seems to hopefully make sense. Breakfast tea from a pre-warmed cozy, leaves pressed into the infuser, offered strong with brown sugar cubes. Tea of confessions, a shimmering world of grace with eggs for breakfast and a tea pantry of iridescent tins with luminosity in rows a gallery exhibit of Earl Grey, the Prince of Wales, Darjeeling, Oolong. Each night, another aromatic visitation as Grace, Paul's mum, brings her trilogy of thick albums from the highest bookshelf. Tea-stained photographs of a shy girl from Liverpool, born between the wars. Grace, of survival. Grace, born of the dockyards and steel strip mills, whose geologist son travels the Himalayas to Goa to Assam. Paul's postcard from West Bengal. Tea time, a picture of 500 women kneeling to pluck leaves, their baskets filled on the night of the summer solstice the most lavish tea in the world. In the English market each Thursday, cozies and strainers, alchemical objects from unaltered millennia, a pinch of leaves left in a teacup, an acorn, an owl telling the future, displeased with what it sees. Tea flavored mints at the midnight pharmacy, to disguise whiskey or weed on a young boy's breath. The sky tea colored against poplars and lindens mirroring a tea shaped pond. Tea tales so high they tumble into the next century. Tea mother who taught infant school who traveled to class via scooter commuting along the Calthorpe close. Grace of the cigarette and the tea towel, the late night cheese and onion sandwiches, grace of the inquisitive mind, imbibing midnight's children in love with the life of pie, tea of generosity, grace's wealth measured out in lemon balm, in well-used spoons, messages she writes now on tea bag sized post-its. I am 88 years old. I am grandmother to Rebecca, to Ellie. Grace featured on the BBC News, the poster woman for dementia. And the once upon time Grace who took me in, a temporal immigrant and illegal alien and became my closest friend over tea. I just came back from a reading from this book in Ireland um, because the books come out and it's from an Irish publisher. And it was a high point that my friend Paul came over from England to Ireland to hear me read that poem. So it felt like he and Grace were with me. I know it's been a long, long afternoon. So I'm just going to end with a poem that I hope will be a bit uplifting and bring in the idea that I tend to travel, even if it's across Seattle or across the world. And this poem, I think you'll get it, but it takes place in Morocco. I'd never been to Morocco. And when I turned 60, it was time to go. How to travel in the middle period. Say yes to the open scab dog that accompanies you through the village. And yes to the wood ash that rises up daily from the workers' rooms to the farmer on his tractor who calls from you, calls to you from across a broad distance. Bonjour, Madame, ça va? On your first Atlas Mountain morning in Umas. Say we oui to the tribe of cats and wood turtles that appear along the lip of the pool waiting for a bite of the sunbathers' bananas. Taste yes 
in the breakfast of argon butter and almonds, tattoo yes to the remaining you and the changing you to the first full body scrub. Watch as parts of you roll and scatter away as the Moroccan woman leads you from steam hall to shower to bath. Yes, anointed with oils of geranium and rose. And so you've learned to travel through multiple waters and sky in the glide and drift of it, like tree goats that, forward, that forage, then build their lives mid-air, knowing yes as the one chosen thing. Thank you. Oh, Susan, thank you. I am so glad, we're all glad that you were able to make it today. What, what a treat. And um, at the end, what, what we like to do is just hear the, the three of you um, maybe have a, a, a little bit of a chat. And I know we don't have much time and I hate to take up more of your valuable time, but I'd love to hear a little conversation with you, wise women. And um, the one thing that I was thinking of since we've got you all here in the room and you've mentioned it, Susan, and kind of tied a, a little, a, made me think of it. And, and again, you don't have to talk about this. You can talk about anything you want, really. It'd be anything you have to say I'd, we're interested in. But um, I was thinking about the value of women uh, mentors and teachers. And if if you care to just have a little conversation about that, about the, you know, if, if that has been big in, in your lives and maybe who they were and, and a little bit about that with with the three of you, if that's, um, but you can go off in any kind of direction that you want to. But again, I we won't take up too much of your time, but it would be really lovely to hear what you all have to say about that, if you'd like. I'm happy to start. Uh, I have always gone for dead mentors. And, um, I think it's it's cleaner that way. They're not going to disappoint you. You're not going to have to worry what happens, what you say to them. If you run into each other at a conference, their body of work is done. It just, um, and you can choose whoever you want. So I'm saying it tongue in cheek, but I actually mean Elizabeth Bishop and Anne Sexton and Adrian Rich were all really important mentors to me. And either I discovered them in their last years of life or after they had already gone. So I always wished to have a mentor that was, you know, someone who would take me for tea and tell me I was great, but that has not happened yet. I do try to do that for students because I feel it's extraordinarily powerful to let somebody know that they should keep writing and that you are moved by what they write. So. I try in many ways to give to um, my students what maybe I wished for myself, but didn't mm -hmm. get. That's yeah. what I got. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had to, I'll jump in too. I um, didn't have the traditional mentorship either. Um, and I do try to be there for students. I do have many, I, so I think mentors for me were also people that were, the, that was the book itself became, you know, it was the mentor like what, looking at that reading, looking at their writing and reading it. Um, I have so many people I admire though, um, so many women that I, I admire. And I feel like it's a little different than men, they're not my mentor, but I look to them. I look to who they are, what they're doing, what they're writing. So I guess that is a form of mentorship in a way. It's like a one way, <laughs> you know, but um, so, and then outside of our work, like outside of our creative space, there's women in my life who would be mentors for just how to how to live my life. You know, family members. My, I have a great aunt and my mom. Both are women who I look to to want to be like. You know, like there's aspects of them that I would want to want to model. Um, so I don't have it. I you named many of them, um, Susan. That you know that are people that I would go to the page for, so to say. Um, and then who's lives and work that are still living that I look to right now as women that are, I think are leaders within the, the world of poetry, you know, there's, there's many of them. I mean, I can, I feel like I could name, you know, like I look at, look to Carolyn Frechet, I look to Patricia Smith, I look to Dana Levin, I look to Sharon Old, I look to Dorian Luck, like I could just, you know, you know, they are just all people that I really, really admire. Yeah. 
I um I can't think of living mentors besides you know like certain great aunts that have passed on that you know gave me infused me with a lot of confidence and love. Um, it's funny. Um, Grace Jones is one of my um, <laughs> touchstones, the one that not your Grace Jones, <laughs> but one of my artistic touchstones. So I'm glad that her name was brought up here. Um, I think, you know, just moments of just hearing your work was a mentoring moment for me. Mm -hmm. um, really, really exciting and inspiring. And so I, I think of mentorship. And I do talk to the young people. Um, a, a big reason I do a lot of my work is for, you know, to encourage them. So those are just my add on thoughts around mentorship. But I like your dead mentors. Um, I think of my ancestors as my mentors and like the dream time as being a time of being taught and, um, you know, being able to take in information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, this has just been been wonderful. And again, I, we don't want to take up more of your time than we already have. Um, I, uh, I I can't thank you all enough for sharing your work with us today and um, being part of this um, really special series um, uh, of Alaska Quarterly Review contributors. And um, on behalf of the uh, Center for the Narrative and Lyric Arts, um, all of our gratitude and also uh, a big thanks again to Cody Carver and the Anchorage Museum at Rasmussen Center who produced this program and who have also showcased Allison's work and published her book. <laughs> and um, speaking of which, the, the really the best way for you to support um, these writers and poets is to buy their books, uh, preferably from a local independent bookstore and to share them with your friends or to subscribe to journals like Alaska Quarterly Review. And uh, please consider uh, making a donation to AQR today so that we can continue uh, to bring you uh, more uh, voices, um, inspiring voices like the ones you uh, heard today. So uh, Ron, uh, the last word is yours, always. Well, <clears throat> I wanna thank our writers. Um, what a great, inspiring reading. So thank you so much. Thank you, Heather. Uh, thank you, Cody. And thank everyone who has joined us today. So until our next event, I look forward to joining with you then. Um, um, I'll say goodbye for now.